right, so let's look at some uses that we have for our target tape. So one of the uses that we can use all of the target tape animals for um, is to eat them directly. So we can eat these uh, plants and animals directly, either in terms of like sashimi or sushi, or you can buy like a filet of fish um, and eat that for dinner, or you can have some sort of like shellfish and like in chowder, so like clam chowder, or you can even go to like a raw bar and you can eat some of these things raw or steamed. Um, and then you can also eat like calamari if you ever have like the crunchy seaweed snack soup, those are algae. So you can eat that target take directly. Um, sometimes we take that target take and then we actually like grind up the fish and we use those as fertilizer. So take the fish, grind them up very finely. Um, use it as fertilizer. And this kind of fertilizer is actually sold in most markets um, as organic fertilizer. So a lot of your organic foods are grown with like fish as fertilizer. Right? Yeah, so it's the, the organic or natural fertilizer. And here's some pictures so you can see what that might look like. We can also take and use that target take uh, fish meal. So it can be ground up and then used in all sorts of different kinds of things, like in dog food. So sometimes if you have a dog, um, their food will have some of those fish meal in it. In it. Um, and then we can also use it in like aquaculture. So we'll take and we'll feed fish or fish meal to like the fish that we're trying to raise for um, like monetary purposes. So we can feed it to like bluefin tuna as we try and raise bluefin tuna. Um, because they make a lot of money for it. The problem with this, or we, oh sorry, and we can also feed it to things like cattle and stuff like that, um, pigs, chickens um, that we find on land. Um, but the problem is that that's really, really inefficient. So typically the kinds of things that we are fishing out of the ocean that, that go into making these fish meal um, are like things that are like sardines. So they're filter feeders. So they are going to be both primary uh, consumers and secondary consumers, depending on what they're eating, right? So they will, if they're eating the phytoplankton, they'll be primary consumers. If they're eating like the kofi pods and stuff, they will be secondary consumers. Um, if we take a bunch of those animals out, we grind them up, and then we feed them to a cow, and a cow is an herbivore, right? You're taking something that normally is eating the primary producer directly, so it's a primary consumer, and you're feeding them these things that aren't natural uh, for them to eat. And then second, they are already like technically in a comparison of the food chain to stuff above those animals. So you're kind of taking a higher level of the food chain and feeding it to a lower level. Does that make sense? And then uh, that's also a problem because remember when we talked about energy being passed up the food chain, only 10% gets passed on. So you now take this top upper level of the food chain, you take it and you feed it to these cattle, and if you take 1 million pounds of those fish, it's only going to produce 0.1 million pounds of beef. So we're better off eating the fish rather than eating the beef. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, we can also just use part of the thing that we catch. So like, it, like we've already previously talked about this year, uh, shark fitting. So we will take and cut off the fins of sharks, toss the body back because there's no market for it, um, and then keep the fins and sell the fins. The problem with this, like we've already discussed, sharks are very long-lived species. They take a long time to replace themselves. So it's bad because we're taking out all of these top predators of the ocean that can't replace themselves as fast as we are taking them out. So it's a problem. <laughs> okay, let's look at some of the fishing methods and some of the bycatch issues with these fishing methods. So, um, how many of you have ever seen deadliest catch? Okay, so deadliest catch uses this method of fishing. It's called pots, okay, or traps. Um, and so what it is is it's a baited trap. So they put bait some sort of like dead fish or something like that in the in the pot and then they send that to the bottom um, and then things like crabs and lobsters that are agile enough can actually crawl in there and they go after the bait and then they get in but they can't get out and then you pull up the pot and you have what you want 
So um, this is a really good method of fishing because the bycatch issues for this are really, really low. And if you do get any bycatch in there, then the things are typically still alive when you bring it back up to the surface. And, um, and they can be tossed back and they'll be fine. Okay, so toss is actually a good method of fishing in terms of bycatch and stuff. So very, very good. Another method of fishing is long lining. So this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a long line that has thousands of baited hooks on it. So they'll take and they'll toss this line overboard that has all these hooks. And it'll either be used for pelagic fish or for benthic fish. Um, if it's for pelagic fish, they'll have kind of buoys on there to keep the, the line up in the water. If it's for benthic fish, they'll weight it so that it sinks to the bottom. Um, and the fish go after the bait that's on the hook, and then they get the hook in their mouth and they're caught. The problem is you have very, very high um, bycatch with this method of fishing. So what happens is there's fish that are caught on these hooks, and other animals go after those fish. Um, and then they get caught on the hooks as well. Or the line, they can't see it, and so they'll get entangled in that line, and they'll drown and die. So you get all sorts of like birds and turtles and mammals that are caught in these lines for long life. Persaining. So you guys remember the uh, the end of Finding Nemo, where it's like Nemo's like saving the school of fish and he goes into the net and he's like swim down, swim down, right? And he gets all the fish to swim down. Okay, that's called um, persaining. <laughs> It's used for schooling fish. What they do is they will take this net and they will drive in a circle around the school of fish. And then they, the bottom of the net is like a drawstring. And so they'll close the bottom of the net and then pull up that whole school of fish. Um, the problem is you do get quite a bit of bycatch with this method because you get all sorts of things that are um, eating. This type of, these types of fish, because they're typically bait fish, so they tend to serve as a food source for lots of animals. So um, you get lots of like fish and mammals that would normally feed on them caught in these nets as well. All right, gill nets. So gill nets are just basically nets that have like buoys on the top and weights on the bottom to, to keep the net open, um, and then the holes in the net are big enough for fish to kind of like swim into the net and get their head caught, but not big enough for the fish to swim all the way through. Um, and then if they try and like back out, the, the, their gills, their gill covers, the operculus, get caught on the net and they can't get out. So that's why it's called a gill net. They get caught by their gills. The problem is this method of fishing, nothing can see the net. So you get tons and tons and tons of animals that get caught in these. All sorts of Turtles and mammals and birds would also get caught in here. Um, and actually, it, you have such high bycatch with this method of fishing that it's now banned. Because there's just so many animals that were being killed by this method of fishing. So now, gill netting is illegal. So you can't use it. Trawling and dredging. So, trawling is fishing for fish at a depth and dredging is going to be on the bottom. And it's basically a big square net that you get that gets dragged either at a depth or along the bottom. And whatever's in front of that net it makes it into the back of the net and then gets pulled up. The bycatch with this type of fishing is also very high because anything that's in the way gets into the net. Um, and if you're dredging, pulling that net along the bottom, you're going to have lots of bottom habitats that are destroyed, like we were talking about with the deep sea corals. So it can be a very destructive method of fishing as well. If you keep going back and forth over the same spot, you're going to get lots of damage in that habitat as well. Harpooning. So Harpooning is basically a spear attached to a line 
And uh, you use, they use harpoons to catch bigger animals, so like the bluefin tuna and some of the bigger like fish, like swordfish and stuff like that. Um, and then also for things like whales. Uh, harpooning is a pretty good method of fishing because unless you're a really bad game, you get no bycatch. So you shouldn't have any bycatch with this method. And this is what it looks like. So they've typically got a prow that has like a spot for a person to stand on to harpoon the fish. <laughs> All right, ghost fishing. Ghost fishing occurs when um, nets or gear are lost and they continue to fish. So either like they get cut off of their buoys that hold them in place or their anchors, um, or the person forgets where they dropped the net, they can't find it, um, and so that net is lost. What happens is, even though there's no person checking that lost gear, it still goes on fishing. So stuff still gets caught in that, in that lost gear, and things still die. So you get all sorts of things that will be caught in these lofts when you're seeing that. You get things like dolphins and turtles and all sorts of birds as well as fish that will be in the net. Um, ghost fishing can also get caught like on reefs and kill all sorts of reef animals as well. And it is a huge problem. We get thousands and thousands and thousands of animals that die every year from lost gear. And really the only thing that we can do to like stop it is like remove any gear that we find. Uh, this picture on the left here is a beach where you've had like just a ton of this ghost fishing or lost gear wash up. And if you're interested in this, there's a website for you to go so you can actually look and see kinds of things that are being found. Okay, bycatch fixes. So how do we reduce the amount of bycatch that we find? Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service has an observer program. So, the National Marine Fisheries Service has an observer program where they will put observers onto boats, and those observers will record like the types of things that are caught as bycatch, so that you know what kinds of things are being impacted um, by different types of fisheries. And they're also going to be there to check and make sure that any sort of gear modifications that we've done to try and reduce bycatch are actually working. So you could actually sign up if you wanted to, to be part of the National Marine Fisheries Observer Program and you get some training and go live on a boat for three months and keep track of bycatch if you want. Um, other ways that we can reduce bycatch is we can uh, modify our gear or our fishing method to try and reduce the amount of bycatch that we get. So like we talked about previously with the TET, the turtle exclusion device, um, we modified the gear so that fewer turtles were caught in the net. And that was very successful. Also, we're putting ribbons on long lines because the fish aren't smart enough to like avoid the hooks, but the other animals see the ribbons on the long lines and they don't get caught in the long lines as much. Um, and then also dolphin fake tuna, which we'll discuss in this minute. Public awareness is also part of the fix for bycatch issues because if nobody knows what's going on, um, then people can't use their power. And people actually have a lot of power when it comes to um, demand, right? So if you decide to boycott something because it's not caught in a sustainable method, and many, many, many people did that, then the fishermen now don't have a source of income and they have to figure something else out some other way to catch the fish so that you reduce the amount of bycatch. And that's actually what happened um, with dolphin safe tuna. <laughs> so dolphin safe tuna, what happened was um, there were lots and lots of dolphins that were being caught in nets um, by tuna fishermen because the dolphins would follow the tuna in order to find the, the food that they wanted. Um, so the dolphins follow the tuna to find their food, and they'd also eat some of the tuna. Um, but the, the tuna fishermen were doing purse seining, and they'd encircle this school of tuna, and they'd also catch tons and tons and tons of dolphins in, with the tuna. People found out that lots of tuna were, or dolphins were dying with uh, the catching of tuna, so there was like a nationwide boycott on canned tuna, and tuna in general. Um, and so 
that caused the tuna fishermen to be like, oh, hey, we don't, we're not making any money. What can we do differently so that people start buying our product again? So they figured out a way, a different fishing method that um, allows for them to catch the tuna, but allows for the dolphins to escape. So what they do now is they will encircle both the tuna and the dolphins, and then they'll do what's called backing up, where they'll open the net a little bit, and they've got a person to help guide the dolphins up, because the dolphins are smart enough to know, like, hey, go this way, and I'll get out, whereas the fish are not. So they get the dolphins out, close the net back up, and we get tuna, and we're happy, and the dolphins are saved, so everybody's happy. So it was just one, like, simple fix, and you can save hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dolphins. Pretty good. So now when you buy your, your canned tuna, you'll see lots of like, these symbols over here on the right on your canned tuna. That's what it means. It goes caught in a way that uh, dolphins were not harmed. So it's all because of public awareness and public pressure. So fish can be a renewable resource if we fish them properly and we take care of them to make sure that there's enough left to reproduce. Uh, with, and replace themselves over time. Uh, the way that we actually manage these fish and try and make them renewable resources uh, is by managing different stocks of fish. And so a stock of fish is a group of one kind of fish in an area that does not breed with fish of the same species in the same area. So if you've got two like schools of tuna, in the, same, in the same species in the same area, but they don't interbreed with each other. That's considered to be a stock of fish. So um, that's what we call a stock. So in order to be able to manage the stock properly, you really, really need to understand a lot about them um, and how to help them survive. So you need to understand what's called the essential fish habitat, so where the animal lives throughout its lifetime. And that can change. Remember, certain kinds of fish will spend part of their life in estuaries, they'll grow up in estuaries before they move out to the open ocean. Or they'll grow up in rivers and streams before they move out to the open ocean. So if we need to help to protect our fish stocks, then we need to understand where they live so we can protect them at both places, or all the places where they live. We also need to know the size and the age of the stocks so we know what's happening to the current population. Is the current population increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it staying stable? What's going on? Uh, we need to know about the biology of the fish, so like the age and the size of the fish at which they replace themselves. So that's oftentimes why if you ever go fishing, there's like a size limit on the fish. So if they're smaller than a certain size, you have to toss them back because they haven't had time to reproduce yet. They're not mature yet. So once they reach a certain size, that means they've had the opportunity to reproduce and you can catch them, then eat them. So that's why we need to know the age and the size that they replace themselves. We also need to know their migration patterns and where we can find large numbers of them so we can protect them in that area as well. How we actually get this information, we get it um, from the fish. So we will tag the fish either with a GPS tracker so we can try to track it using a GPS tracker or um, oftentimes if it's like salmon and stuff like that, they'll just put like a number tag on there. And so when the, the scientist tags the fish, we'll take like the size of the fish, um, the location of where it was caught, the date, and then they'll put a number on it and release it. So if a fisherman catches that fish with a tag on it, they will also take the location that they caught the fish, the size of the fish, um, and then they'll send that information to the scientists. And so from that information, they can tell like the geographic range of the fish, so where it first was caught, where it was sec caught at the second time. Um, and the difference in the size of the fish can tell you about how fast they grow. And it can also tell us some information about the relationship between the size of the fish and its habitat, where it lives. We can also get DNA information from the fish to tell us the relationship between the stocks. Um, to see if like, they used to be one stock and then they got so large that they split. And the DNA can also tell us the genetic health. So if there's a lot of genetic variability in a stock of fish, that's really, really good. Um, if there's not a lot, that could spell trouble. So it gives us some information about the uh, genetic health. We can also do laboratory experiments, and then fishermen can also provide records and data for us to give us some information. 
So how do we manage these stocks? Well, the goal is to make sure that there are enough fish that survive each year so that they can replace themselves and we can maintain the numbers of the fish that are needed and sustain the population. The problem is that most of the times we don't start to manage fish stocks until there's a problem. So, for example, um, cod, Atlantic cod, in 1986, um, we had 1.2 million fish of Atlantic cod, and then 10 years later in 1996, we were down to 15,000 fish. And at that point, we were like, oh, uh, that's bad. So, at that point, that's when we were like, okay, there's a complete and total ban on fishing of Atlantic cod. Um, and we tried to protect those guys and help them to come back. They've recovered a little bit, but still not they're still not recovering at the same at the rate in which we would like them to recover. So there's still uh, not as many Atlantic cod as there should be. Atlantic cod are one of the things that you should absolutely not eat. So if you're ever somewhere and they're trying to sell you Atlantic cod, it's illegal to fish for them. So they shouldn't be. The other problem is too that fish don't recognize boundaries. So they're not like swimming in the ocean like, ooh, I'm so safe in, in U.S. waters and they get to a certain point and like, oh, that's international waters, unfair game over there, and then turn around and swim back into U.S. waters. They, they just go wherever they want uh, as they need to. So we get different countries manage fish stocks differently, and so it's a problem because some fish get caught where others get let go in other countries. In fact, we almost went to war with Canada over salmon. So, because salmon travel up rivers in order to spawn, and so some of the salmon were like starting in the U.S., and then as they move up the river, they would move from the U.S. into Canadian waters. Um, and some of the U.S. fishermen were like letting some of these fish go, and then the Canadians were catching them, and vice versa. So some of the rivers come into the U.S. waters. So there was this big like controversy, and people were getting really angry at each other. Um, and we did almost go to war over salmon. We actually have a treaty with Canada over salmon. So, yeah. When was this? Uh, in the 80s. Yes. <laughs> so, we still have this treaty in effect today. All right. The other problem with conservation efforts of like habitats like coral reefs is that we have this thing called shifting baselines. So if you look at this picture here, uh, this is like a coral reef in 1988. Okay? And so we say, like, okay, you look at this picture, like, this is a healthy coral reef. This is our baseline. We know that in 1998 that this is a degraded situation. So we, we're going to say, we know that this is a healthy reef in 1988. So we want to conserve this reef and get it back to the point that it was in 1988. The problem is, if you look even further back in the past, and you go back to like 1959, that's actually what the healthy reef looked like. But we've accepted what the degraded situation is completely normal and healthy. So the baseline for what is considered to be healthy shifts. And so we accept a degraded situation as normal, which is not good. So it's called shifting baselines. So how do we resolve these fishery issues? Well, uh, basically, we need political will. So we need to kind of like dedicate some money to researching and learning a lot about these fish stocks before there's a problem. So we need to protect things and conserve things before they reach the point where it's like an emergency. We also need better relationships between stakeholders, meaning people that have some sort of interest in this kind of business. So like the fishermen, the people, the public that's concerned about not depleting all the fish stocks, um, the politicians, the managers, everybody, all the stakeholders, we need to have uh, better relationships. Basically, we all want the same thing. So we all want there to be enough fish for the fishermen to make money, to allow for there to be enough fish to sustain the fish stocks. Um, but everybody speaks different languages. And so there's misunderstandings um, and fights that go on 
We also need better international re regulation. So we need fish stocks to be managed um, the same in different areas of the world. So it doesn't matter if a fish swims from U.S. waters into ca Canadian waters, they're managed the same way. We also have these things called thank you, state marine life protected areas. So this is where we take and we um, say this habitat right here, or this area in the ocean, is completely cut off from fishing. So in this area, no fishing whatsoever. So it's called a no-take zone. Um, outside of that area, you're free to fish. What happens is, because this habitat is protected, the animals that are in here reproduce, they grow large, they're healthy, um, and eventually the, the populations get so large that there's not enough space in the protected area, so they move outside of the protected area, and they get caught by fishermen outside of there. So it replenishes the stock uh, in the areas that surround the marine life protected areas. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's some of them that are like in Channel Islands that are no take zones. They're marine life protected areas. So you actually have to vote on these to keep them marine life protected areas. So if you ever see that come up on the ballot, um, both keep green life protected areas around. It basically mimics what used to be the case where we can when we couldn't um, fish everywhere in the ocean. And so those things like protected areas were natural. Now not so much. Okay, so what can you do? So be aware of what's going on. Purpose of the community. So we need to be aware of what's going on. Um, we need to know about the things that need to be voted on for renewable. You also need can be selective in the things that you buy. So use that Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch guide and be a smart consumer. Don't buy things that are endangered or um, the stocks are low. Buy things that local, things that are caught in a sustainable method. You can also help to improve the ocean environment by reducing, reusing, and recycling. So reduce the amount of waste you use. Use a reusable shopping bag. Use reusable water bottles. Use reusable coffee cups. Uh, pick up any trash that you find, especially plastic. And don't litter. And you can be involved, so you can be part of the coastal cleanup day and pick up trash on the beaches. You can be part of the National Marine Fisheries Observer Program. You can be part of neighborhood cleanups where you go through and clean up trash out of neighborhoods. You can be active in writing to your local senators and representatives in order to make them aware of what's going on. And the biggest thing to remember is that even if you just make one small change, uh, it can make a big difference. If everybody makes one small change, it can have a huge impact. So start using a reusable water bottle or recycle those water bottles. 